These little, or sometimes not so little boxes, caused quite a few problems for the government, and here's why. The history of the cordless phone stretches back to at least 1956, when an inventor from Texas, Dr. Raymond Phillips Sr., first documented the idea. In 1965, a musician named Terry Paul made a working version of a cordless phone, but the method it used to communicate could span over a range of two miles and interfered with aircraft communication, making the device unmarketable, and the rest is history. But this video isn't about the history of cordless phones as such, but rather the rafts of illegal sets that flooded Britain in the 1980s and 1990s, which kept the DTI very busy. The DTI, more specifically the Radio Investigation Service, an arm of the British government, realised that all manner of illegal cordless phones were making their way into the UK, and although they were legal in their countries of origin, they weren't legal here, as they transmitted across otherwise allocated parts of the spectrum. Analogue cordless phones allowed eavesdroppers to hear your private conversations and became sort of a bugging device within the home. Therefore, new models from other countries became big sellers as they offered a move to more obscure frequencies than those allocated in the UK. Nowadays, cordless telephones operate on DECT, but until the mid-2000s, there were still large quantities of analogue cordless phones in people's homes that were totally unsecure and could be listened to on a radio scanner. More importantly, the DTI was also listening. This really amazing cordless phone I've been showing you is a Shuttle A7000, a model that came from the USA in around 1983. I've been really excited to show you this as it's brand new and unused and still in the box and comes with some amazing accessories and antennas. There has been quite a few legal sets of frequencies allocated to cordless phones over the years across a couple of different standards. There was CT0, which was a European and Asian cordless telephone standard, which as far as I can tell started around 1980. The frequencies used varied from country to country. Here you can see the UK frequencies, but there were different frequencies for places like France, Australia and New Zealand, Spain, the Netherlands and China, South Korea and Taiwan. Then there was CT1, which was established in 1984. This was the most popular mode and is still around today if you're lucky enough to hear one. There were other legal allocations over the years such as extended range cordless phones with the handsets on 47.4 and base stations on 77.5 across two channels. During the early 1990s there were some US spec cordless phones which made their way to the UK and became quite popular. Again, these used many different frequencies depending on their age, and whilst legal in the USA, they were illegal in the UK, and attracted the attention of the DTI. There was an allocation of legal analogue CT1 cordless phone channels within the 900MHz band, which were eventually withdrawn because they overlapped with GSM channels. These were legal in the UK and Europe, but were quickly phased out. There were also some illegal cordless phones on some of the old UK analogue police, ambulance and fire frequencies. There were three known frequencies and it's believed that these phones came out of China and were tracked by the DTI in the northwest of England. There were even some cordless phones in small numbers that used frequencies within the military airband. Then there was all sorts of American cordless phone allocations such as the ones you can see here, all using analogue FM. There was actually a lot more than this, but these were the most common ones. So this phone, as I said, is the Shuttle A7000, and I can't find much information on the phone or the company. I know they started trading in 1983, and this phone dates from around that time. It's actually brand new and boxed, and has the base station with its 1.2 watt output, and the handset with its 0.5 watt output power. The base station transmits in the 49MHz portion of the spectrum and the handset around the 70MHz portion. These weren't widely used sets of frequencies in the USA, but they were legal over there. The base station is really interesting in that it has a built-in battery charger and it plugs into the mains and the phone line, although these were completely illegal for use on BT phone lines and it carries warnings on both the box and the base station itself. 
The handset is huge and comes with either this rubber duck antenna or a telescopic variant. What I love about this is the range of antennas it comes with. The base station has a screw in PL plug telescopic aerial as well as this really cool dipole which as you can see is really big. It comes with a mounting bracket for external use and a long coax cable. There's also a mag mount and a whip aerial for use with the handset as well. The handset comes with a faux leather case as well as a carry strap which unfortunately is missing. So these exact phones were the subject of numerous DTI raids in the 1980s and 1990s. Their transmitting proximity to these 6 meter and 4 meter amateur bands made them easy to happen upon which led to complaints from radio amateurs. The large rooftop aerials were easy to spot and often what would happen was the DTI agents would see one at a premises and just wait for the phone to fire up. Once this happened they could then raid them. A branch of the Wimpy Fast Food Restaurant in Stanmore Broadway also had one of these on site in the 1980s and they were raided by the DTI. The phone was confiscated and ultimately destroyed. Phones like this were commonly seen on cars too and again the whip aerial and magnetic mount made them easy to spot and target. Numerous cases involving these phones actually went to court with fines being issued and of course the confiscation of equipment. What's interesting is that there were also 100 watt base station versions of these types of phones which were advertised freely in amateur radio and CB radio magazines back in the 1980s. The fact that they weren't licensed for use in the UK only appeared in the small print and this was often eclipsed by claims of nationwide coverage which enticed people to buy them. Of course, and I'm sure you've gathered by now, firing up this set would be illegal, so we'll leave this one here. Mm -hmm.